Hey everyone, it's Kara here, and I am here to do another episode of Dietitian Talk. I do want to take a minute to thank everyone that came up to me at the Arnold. I got a lot of good feedback that you guys really enjoy these videos, so um, I will keep making them if you guys keep liking them, so thank you for that. Um, for today's topic, I kind of wanted to do a summary based on a conference I just went to. Um, as a registered dietitian, I have to do continuing education requirements and submit a portfolio and all that good stuff because, you know, the information out there is ever changing. So I do have to stay up to date. Um, so the conference I went to was extremely interesting and eye opening and motivating to me, not only as a professional, but just in my own personal life. So I wanted to share some of that information today. Um, the conference I went to was called Food Addiction, and it also discussed um, the links with obesity and diabetes, but um, for the most part, I'm just going to kind of rehash some of the information I learned on food addiction. Um, it was a full-day conference, so obviously I can't get into like super detail and, and go through everything, but if you do have the opportunity to do a conference like that, I did find it very beneficial, um, whether you need the continuing education credits or not. Uh, the presentation was given by a registered dietitian named Michelle Albers, I believe, and it was through the INR, the Institute of Natural Resources. So it's a nonprofit organization, totally science-based, um, and I'm very particular about what conferences I go to to make sure that the information I receive is non-biased and accurate. So this was an excellent conference, very up-to-date. They gave us a list of like nine pages of resources. So it was more of a general um, type of conference since it was just one day, but it gave me a lot of good information to further investigate on my own. So in terms of food addiction, I found it very interesting because the premise of most of the conference really compared food addiction to substance abuse, drug abuse, drug addiction. And I guess I, you know, I've kind of thought about it in that way, but not really to this degree. Um, there currently is no DSM criteria or diagnostic ability to say someone is a food addict. However, there's a lot of research going on and more to come that I really wouldn't be surprised if, you know, come the next five, 10 years, you can actually diagnose someone with food addiction. So one of the things that we talked about, which is kind of common sense, but sometimes it's good to go back to common sense and, and think about things in a general perspective and just thinking about how we eat currently in 2015. And, you know, this lady was talking to a room filled of health professionals, and not one of us in there is perfect. But one of the main things she touched on was, you know, going back, you know, even 500 years and thinking about how we used to eat. You know, you used to eat because it was a need. It was a, a psychological need. Your body needed food. You had to go out. You had to find food. And that was kind of the reward was giving your body what it needed to be able to sustain life. Flash forward now, we don't really eat like that, um, even myself. And throughout the conference, I was kind of personalizing how I do things versus how I'll use this information working with patients, which was kind of cool and very eye-opening for me. Um, even myself, I don't always eat based on a, on a physiological need. I don't always eat because I'm hungry. Sometimes, for a lot of people, I think with a busy schedule, you eat when you have time to you know, especially during the workday, or that's where many people don't eat at all during the workday because they are so busy, they choose not to eat because they're not even thinking about it, it's not important to them at the time. Um, or we eat for several other reasons, you know, due to other emotions, you know, if someone gets a promotion, I'm gonna invite you over and we're gonna eat and celebrate. Or if someone dies, I'll also invite you over and we're gonna eat and celebrate in some way. You know, so we eat for a variety of reasons, non-hunger based. So in a way, and she brought it back to the brain and all the um, neurotransmitters and receptors, which I won't go into detail with because I'd probably screw it up and not make sense. But um, our brain has this reward mechanism within itself 
Um, when we eat, we feel rewarded. And we've kind of got, gotten away from that in a bad way, that we're not eating based on the reward that we need to fuel our body. It's just a reward for other reasons, for emotional reasons, stress, etc. So very much so as a society, we've gotten away from eating for you know, fueling our body. And I thought it was really cool and it kind of sounds funny, but now it's really sticking with me. She talked about your organism and thinking about your entire body as an organism, which is what we are. And this is the organism we have to live in and grow in and, and live our lives in. And we don't really think about taking care of the organism. And I heard an analogy the other day, and I can't remember where, but I thought it was a really good way of thinking about it. When you have a brand new car, you do everything to take care of it, right? You clean it, you get those oil changes when you need to, you put your snow tires on, you wash it, you do all that stuff to take care of it because you want to keep it in tip-top prime condition. Yet, a car is replaceable. Our bodies are not you know, our organism is not, yet how many of us can sit there and say, we do everything we need to to maintain our organism, to keep it in tip-top shape, to keep it performing in tip-top shape? I don't think many of us can. And even in a room of health professionals, like, I'm pretty sure the majority of us couldn't have raised our hands and said, yes, I do everything I need to for my organism which I know sounds kind of like geeky, but I love it. Thinking about your organism and thinking about the body. And so many times we get caught up in so many other things that we don't think about why we're eating and what we're eating. And I'll kind of go all over the place in this video a little bit because there was so much information and I was trying to be like a sponge and soak it all up. So I'll just kind of spit it all out to what I remember of it. Um, but there was a lot of comparisons with, um, with drug addiction and that you, there's plenty of studies that show even in rats that when you get that fat, sugar, salt combination, that shit is addicting. It really is. And it's interesting because if you think about it, and I can speak from experience to this, when I've eaten foods like that, um, you crave it more. You really do. You it's, it gives you those feelings of euphoria. Actually, your body produces more opioids, which is a drug, you know, and you produce those things within your brain that make you feel friggin' good, you know? So you're not crazy if you feel that way, and you don't need to feel shameful if you feel that way when you eat food or eat large amounts of fat, sugar, salty food. It's common. It's actually a, a response in your body. It's nothing wrong with you. It's to be expected. Um, and it's amazing because in some of the studies they did with rats, when they would give the rats drugs versus that combination, these poor rats, um, drugs versus the combination of fat, salty, sugary foods, the, the rats or mice or whatever they used, they went towards the food versus the drugs. Like they were more addicted to those food choices than they were the drugs, which is kind of crazy. Now, yes, we're not um, mice or rats, but still, it gives you um, kind of an idea of the brain activity that happens. And one of the things she mentioned too was um, they did a study with humans that were depressed and fed them very high fat. Um, they basically placed an NG tube, which is a, a way to um, provide nutrition. And then, you know, they had three different groups. They had a placebo, they had whatever else, and then they had this group that had um, a higher fat nutrition source coming in. And then they actually brought them in and did MRIs of their brain activity. And within that study, they did find that those that were fed the higher fat um, nutrition source saw huge improvements in depression. Like the, the brain activity that went on was that similar of an antidepressant, which to me, I was just like mind blown. I was absolutely mind blown because, you know, I've had like those higher fat meals and it almost does feel a little crazy because it's like I eat it and it makes you feel good and that to me I'm like oh I feel gross that like a cheeseburger and fries makes me feel all good and and warm inside and yeah I'm alive it's kind of weird but that it's studied like that's true that's what it does to you it's like a freaking drug and the more you eat of it 
they have seen you do have withdrawal symptoms. There is stuff shown that shows you have withdrawal like you're a drug addict. You know, it's like when you think about people that went on the Atkins diet, some people can eat low carb and do that and be like good to go for 20 years. And then there's others that try doing Atkins and two days later are like shaking and like jonesing for carbs and like, you know, need to have cake. And then you start like obsessing over like the bakery treats and you can't get it out of your mind. And, you know, like legit withdrawal symptoms. Now, just remember, this is a continuum, and we're all different on this continuum. So as I'm sitting here rambling to you, think about where you are on the continuum in terms of your ability to lose weight. And um, like some people can just, some people are like, hi, I see carbs and I gain weight. And then other people, you know, can eat a ton of carbs and not gain any weight. So we are all different. Remember, our organisms are different. Our DNA is different. Um, we can't change our DNA. So think about where you are in that continuum because everyone's going to be a little bit different. I always compare myself to my husband. Um, men and women are always different, but in terms of our gene pools and what we have going on in terms of what we can eat and get away with, we're very different. We're very, very different people. Um, so, so think about that as I'm talking about this, because everyone is going to be in a different place on that continuum. Um, so that's kind of the first thing is knowing, knowing your body and thinking about where you are um, with your weight loss goals. And, you know, it, it may be more challenging for you to get there than the next person. Everybody's different. And it's so hard because people are so hard on themselves and we get very impatient because you're doing everything right and you're not seeing the changes maybe your husband sees and he loses weight so much quicker than you. Everyone's different though and, and you just have to remember that. My point is just try to think about where you are on that continuum and acknowledge that everyone is different. Some people burn fat very easily and some people store it very easily. And if you think about it, you know, we are our bodies are built to store fat well. Uh, we are built to prepare for famine. And unfortunately, in 2015, we don't have issues with famine as much anymore like we used to. However, our bodies are still built that way. We're built to prepare for that famine. So everyone's going to be different on that continuum. And try to take that into consideration and just uh, you know, be aware of that to hopefully not get as... Um, stressed out by it or impatient by it and one of the acronyms she mentioned too that i really liked that just kind of summarized things in a nutshell it was miss and i'm not talking about moderate intensity state cardio or whatever it is um movement intake stress and sleep and those are really the four things i want you to think about in your life because when one of those things is off it's gonna it's gonna impact your weight, it's going to impact your health. And everyone's different, you know? So maybe your intake is the same as Joe Blow, but your stress and your sleep are shitty. And you can't manage your stress, and that's causing you to sleep bad. Well, then obviously your weight and your health is going to be impacted by that. So instead of just thinking about and focusing on the diet, which so many people want to, you know, they're just like, tell me what to eat. I'll eat it. I'll do it. I'll do whatever you say and I'll be good to go. And it's not that simple. I have met with some extremely well-educated, very established people. And that's what they'll say is just tell me what to do and I'll do it. It's not that simple. And honestly, in this registered dietitian really kind of um, confirm that for me, you know, it's it's not an information issue. It's not a lack of information. Don't get me wrong, there's some people um, that don't have the information and just need that boost, but for the majority of us, it's not lack of information. It's lack of behavior change. And that's what, you know, you have to think about is how to change those behaviors. Okay, so it's not that I'm going to sit here and educate you guys and you're going to lose 100 pounds and be good to go. You have Each person has to think about what's going on in their lives and what needs to change. 
And it, I love that she did this. She basically called us out as a group of health professionals because there was dietitians, social workers, dentists, pharmacists, you name it. And she said, if we took a class photo right now, how would we look? Would we represent a group of healthcare professionals? Would we represent the people that are giving education and nutrition advice to the world? And all of a sudden you like scan the room and yes, you're judging people, but you scan the room and you're like, oh shit, no, this is kind of embarrassing. You know, when you look around here, I'm sitting there like drinking my gallon jug and I knew I got in a good workout, so I was feeling good, but I'm not perfect no one's perfect, you know? And one of the things she said was, make a vow to yourself that you're not gonna, you know, and I'm speaking to kind of health professionals right now, but it was motivating for me to hear that she said, you know, don't ever ask someone else to do what you're not willing to do, you know? And there are a lot of dietitians out there. Unfortunately, I know quite a few that don't exercise. And that blows my mind to me because you're not, like to me, exercise has, it's never been challenging to me. It's never been that hard for me to motivate myself to exercise because I get so much reward from it in terms of stress, in terms of how I feel about myself. Um, I've just always seen that value there. So I've been fortunate that it's not an issue for me, but not usually. I've had my bouts, don't get me wrong. But there are so many dietitians that don't exercise and that eat fast food like more than the average person and it does it kind of blows my mind so and we look like hypocrites i mean i'm maybe i sound bad in saying that but i totally agree with her you know we have to practice what we preach and we can't be asking people to do stuff we're not going to do i can't expect someone to want to seek me out for nutrition advice if i'm not able to follow it myself what kind of credibility does that give me as a professional. So, you know, I really did take a lot of what she said to heart and it made me identify some things in in my diet and in my life that I need to improve on and you know, and it you can't change everything overnight. It's about starting to set up some small goals and tackle one thing at a time. You know, it takes as an adult about 30 days to make a behavior change, to to make a make something a habit. So think about some of the goals you have that you think you need to improve on and set out to do it for 30 days or so. If it's increasing more fruits and veggies in your diet or if it's improving your, your sleep quality or you know, your stress manage management. You know, thinking about the longer term goals you have and setting up some shorter term goals to get there along the way. Um, so as a health professional, it was just very, very motivating. Um, I really did learn a lot, like it, just one crazy statistic, the fact that like I texted my husband right away that she said in 2030, I mean, you guys have seen the obesity charts. If you haven't, take a look at them. They started in the 90s, the 90s. I mean, I know some of you are young, but I was around in the 90s. That wasn't that long ago. We're talking 20 years here. And the rate at which obesity has grown, it's seriously like, I know I'm a nutrition dork, but it gives me chills. It gives me literally chills and a stomachache because to fix it as I, I just don't know how we're going to fix it. So I liked her message that um, in the, the one of the statistics I forgot to just say there was that by the year 2030, it's projected that 80 percent, 80 or 85 um, will be overweight or obese. That's like, I hope I blew your minds right there because that's sickening to me. It's sickening. The fact that by 2030, 15 years from now, people who are at a healthy weight will be extremely the minority, which makes sense to me because even now when I get patients that come into the hospital that are a healthy weight, people freak out. You got to get them on a high protein, high calorie diet. They're, they're so underweight. They're so malnourished. Look at their bones. No, they're good. That's actually a healthy weight. We're just, as a society, like not used to looking at people of a healthy weight. And I used to get patients that would say that to me all the time. You're anorexic. You need to go eat something. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm a healthy weight. This is what a healthy weight looks like. But we're so skewed as a society, you know, with what's healthy anymore. Because the we're on our way there with the majority of us being overweight, overbeast. So... That statistic shocked me, and it's, 
I don't know. There's no one answer on how to fix this. Plenty of things could be discussed. Um, but I think for starters, for health professionals out there, we have to start by doing it ourselves, number one. We have to be the model of what we want other people to do. And I think a majority of the health professionals don't even do that. So I don't know. It was an extremely eye-opening conference. Um, I could probably do like 19 videos out of this. I did grab a really good book that I plan to read. It's called The, the Hungry Brain um, by Laura Pollock, which talks about a lot of the brain mechanisms, some of our food cravings, and how to control them. And it also talks about the link with Alzheimer's disease and um, prevention of Alzheimer's disease through food choices, which interests me greatly because my grandmother does have Alzheimer's disease. So I'll be reading that, and if I get some good info from that, I'll share it with you guys. So um, I think I'll stop this video here because I know I've been rambling a while. It was such an interesting conference. It was really, really great. Um, I have lots of other good tips on how to um, combat food addiction. So if you guys would like to have me speak more to that, please comment below. Please give this a thumbs up if you guys like this video. It always helps me out and share it with others. I'm trying to bring more people to my channel, trying to grow this channel. You guys are awesome. You guys are my, you know, you guys are probably my number one motivators. And uh, I really do appreciate all your support. So please keep checking back. We'll see you soon. I did also want to mention, too, because this video does directly um, relate to just the general population. Um, in my current role, I'm just more of management, and I'm really trying to get back to being a dietitian and helping people. So I've had some people ask me about um, coaching or consulting, so I do plan to start setting something up in the future. I just want to make sure I have everything kind of all straighten away before I take on clients. But if any of you guys would be interesting, in, interesting, if you'd be interested in um, my services for you, um, please let me know to give me an idea of what the need is. Um, I do hope to offer something like that in the future as well as get my personal trainer certification at some point. But I do plan to offer nutrition guidance um, and have something set up online where I can work with people. So if there's an interest, please let me know. Thanks. All right, let me tell you real quick too before I sink my teeth into this guy. Differences here with my sandwich versus the Arby's Market Fresh sandwich. This sandwich is about 434 calories. Arby's is 800 calories. There's 11 grams of fat in mine. Arby's has 35 grams of fat. 